It's the largest ocean on Earth and the one most pilots seem to avoid. Look at any Trans-Pacific flight and you'll notice something strange. The path bends, not across the ocean, but north along coasts, past Alaska. Why? It's not superstition, not fear, not even the weather at least, not entirely. The real answer is far more complex and brilliant because what looks like avoidance is precision. Every curve, every detour, every deviation is the result of ruthless logic engineered to balance distance fuel, safety, and survival. So why don't most planes fly straight over the Pacific? What makes this one stretch of Earth so uniquely challenging for modern aviation? And how has technology rewritten the rules of what's possible in the skies? Let's explore more. It's one of aviation's greatest visual deceptions. A flight from Los Angeles to Tokyo seems to swerve wildly north over Alaska, skimming the Aleutians, sometimes brushing the Arctic. On a flat map, it feels inefficient, even irrational. But here's the twist. That curve isn't a detour. It's the shortest way there. This is the paradox of a planet wrapped in three dimensions. On a globe, the shortest distance between two points isn't a straight line. It's an arc, a great circle. That's why trans-Pacific flights don't come cut cleanly across the middle of the ocean. The Earth's curvature pulls the optimal route upward, not outward. Therefore, what looks like a meandering arc on your seatback screen is actually razor-sharp precision, slicing miles off the journey, saving thousands in fuel, and shaving precious time from a 12-hour haul. But there's another layer to this. Why don't we just fly that arc straight across the open Pacific? Why does the route always stay close to land, even when the Great Circle allows for something more direct? And what invisible boundary are pilots and airlines still navigating? The Pacific isn't just big, it's empty. When you're cruising 36,000 feet above land, you're never far from a diversion point or an airport to reroute to in case of engine failure or medical emergency. But over the Pacific, that safety net disappears. This is where Extended Range Twin Engine Operational Performance Standards ETOPS comes in. Back in the early days, twin engine aircraft were grounded by a hard limit. They couldn't fly more than 60 minutes away from the nearest airport. That meant zigzagging around oceans, hugging coastal lines or using four engine giants like the 747 to make long haul crossings. But aircraft evolved, engines became more reliable, and regulators responded. Now, thanks to ETOPS extensions, planes like the 787 Dreamliner and Airbus A350 can legally operate up to 370 minutes from a diversion airport. That's over six hours on a single engine, an extraordinary level of trust in modern engineering. But even with that safety envelope, the Pacific still poses a challenge. Unlike the North Atlantic, where airports dot the route from New York to London like stepping stones, the Pacific offers little support. Johnston Attle? Closed. Midway? Bare bones. Hawaii? Isolated. You can't build runways on open water. Therefore, flight paths are shaped not just by efficiency, but by access to emergency landing zones, however sparse or far-flung they may be. In this world, every mile counts. Every contingency matters. And when you're flying across 63 million square miles of deep, empty blue, the margin for error shrinks fast. So if safety is forcing these flight paths to bend, what else is steering them? Could nature itself be drawing invisible highways in the sky? At high altitudes, the air isn't still. It moves with force and rhythm jet streams that snake around the planet like rivers of wind. These atmospheric flows can exceed 200 miles per hour. Catch one heading east, and it'll slingshot your plane across the Pacific, shaving hours off your flight. If you fight against it, you'll burn fuel, time, and profit. Therefore, pilots don't just fly from A to B. They navigate a shifting landscape of air, surfing wind when it helps, dodging it when it threatens. But jet streams come with a cost turbulence, especially the invisible kind, clear air turbulence, which doesn't show up on radar and can slam a plane mid-cruise without warning. In 1997, a flight from Tokyo to Honolulu dropped abruptly due to this phenomenon, injuring passengers and terrifying crew. It was a harsh reminder that jet streams are both ally and adversary. This means route planning becomes a delicate balance maximizing tailwinds without gambling on passenger safety. And that's not the only weather variable. The Pacific breeds 
powerful storms, typhoons, hurricanes, massive thunderheads rising 60,000 feet into the air. These aren't rare outliers, they're seasonal realities. Therefore, even the best laid plans bend to the weather. Real-time updates, satellite monitoring, and predictive models guide the decisions. If a storm builds along the Great Circle route, pilots may detour hundreds of miles to avoid it, which raises the question, if weather, safety, and physics all guide the route, who decides which of those factors takes priority? Who or what optimizes this high-stakes puzzle? Pilots fly the plane, but algorithms plan the path. Behind every long-haul flight is an optimization engine, advanced software weighing fuel loads, aircraft weight, jet stream positions, air traffic congestion, airport status, and geopolitical airspace constraints. It doesn't just calculate distance, it calculates risk, cost, and efficiency. Every variable is considered. Every outcome is simulated. Why? Because fuel is currency in aviation and waste is expensive. In fact, fuel is often the single biggest cost on a trans-Pacific flight. Just one wrong decision, a stronger than expected headwind, a missed opportunity to catch a jet stream can cost an airline tens of thousands of dollars. That's why modern aircraft like the 787 Dreamliner aren't just lighter and longer range. They're also designed to work seamlessly with flight optimization software, constantly adjusting in real time to changing conditions. But economics doesn't stop at weather and fuel. Sometimes it's politics. Take the recent avoidance of Russian airspace by certain carriers. That change, forced by conflict and policy, added hours to otherwise optimized routes. A reminder that global aviation lives at the intersection of engineering and geopolitics. Therefore, the flight path you see isn't just curved, it's negotiated between nature, technology, cost, and the rules of the world below. So if that's how routes are chosen, what happens when we break those rules? Planes do fly directly over the Pacific, just not as often and not without precision planning. Consider Singapore Airlines Flight SQ-37, an 18-hour non-stop journey from Singapore to Los Angeles. It cuts boldly across the Pacific, powered by an Airbus A350-900 ULR. It doesn't avoid the ocean, it conquers it. But not without help, these ultra-long-haul flights rely on next-gen aircraft, strategically placed diversion points, and constant digital communication with ATC via satellite networks. Midway Atoll, Hawaii, Guam. These become lifelines in the event of an emergency, but they're also calculated into the route long before takeoff. Every flight plan is rehearsed digitally before it's ever flown. Fuel is measured down to the kilogram, weather patterns are modeled, alternate airports are locked in, and only then, when all variables are known, is the aircraft cleared to cross. But even these bold Pacific crossings aren't common. They're exceptions made possible by the intersection of ETOPS evolution, tech innovation, and demand-driven economics. Will that change? Almost certainly. Electric propulsion, hydrogen fuel, even hypersonic aircraft, all of them are being developed with greater range, cleaner output, and smarter routing in mind. And with space-based tracking systems like ADSB now covering even the remotest corners of the Pacific, the barriers to crossing that ocean are falling. But here's the truth, even as the rules evolve, the core logic stays the same. Flight paths aren't drawn to impress passengers. They're engineered to balance risk, cost, and time across thousands of miles and billions of dollars. So the next time your flight arcs toward the Arctic instead of crossing the blue, know this. It's not superstition, it's a strategy. But what do you think? Is this about safety first or cost above all? Should airlines prioritize directness when the tech allows it or keep tracing the safest, most calculated arc? And will future aircraft make the Pacific just another puddle to cross? Let us know in the comments. In the end, those curves in the sky aren't errors. They're strategy in action. If you enjoyed this breakdown, subscribe for more stories that decode the skies.